So welcome. Thank you, man. This is Tammy. I don't know if you met Tammy yesterday or Saturday. This is Escott. That would be your name in Spanish. Really? Yeah. I didn't know Hi, I'm Matt. I'm the founder of VRMB and the host of the Vacation Rental Show. And this is season four of Unlocked, the Tiny Architects edition, in which we travel to meet the world's most innovative vacation rental professionals in their element and find out what makes them so special. Um, Scott Shafford. <laughs> What's up, Matt? Good to be here. It's great to be here. It's been how many years in the making? Uh, probably five-ish, five-ish. I started uh, something called Renting Your Place back in 2013, maybe, a website. And you were the, you were the main man, the main influencer at the time. So. No, you I'm and sure. I were like the only ones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and we met, on, um, we met on just email or something. Yeah, I, I probably you know, emailed you. Back and forth. To suck and, some and, now, your head. and now you've gone on to become Scott Shadford. <laughs> the Scott Shadford. The Scott <laughs> Shadford. And AirDNA <laughs> is, and I was describing uh, someone earlier um, who you were, it's the most um, cited resource in our industry, yes? Yeah, yeah, probably, and very strategically so. I mean, we, we saw this huge gap in the marketplace. There was no really sort of trusted source of, this, you know, how big was Airbnb growing? How, how many units are there? What's the occupancy rate, right? And so, you know, early on, we, that was one of our first hires, was a PR hire. But really, her only mandate was anybody who ever writes an Airbnb story, you email them, you offer them free data, and next time they write a story, they're gonna, they'll, they'll cite us, right? And so we've... That was, the, that was it. That was it, yeah. And so that was sort of our growth hack, I, I would say, was making sure that everybody knew who to contact when they needed a number, whether it was how many units there are or you know, what the impact is, whatever, they knew where to go. And so do you then begin quantifying those press wins at the very earliest days? Yeah, I don't think we were that good at it, just about like how many backlinks we had. Um, but there's lots of sources we use now. I think we use something called Meltwater now, which sort of tracks how many impressions you know, this has globally. It's like an expensive is, tool. It's not particularly expensive. I don't know what the cost actually is. But yeah, I mean, we have tens of millions of impressions you know, a month now due to that sort of uh, that PR strategy. Um, I'm going to one day ask you for advice on PR because I just recently have gotten into it myself. And as a small business, it's hard to justify the cost of good PR especially because it takes time to cultivate um, and to really quantify a backlink is hard. Totally. Yeah. A attribution. You know, we have looked at how to do attribution in so many ways, right? We get so much direct traffic. We get social traffic. We get, you know, paid traffic. You know, where is it coming from? You know, how much is sort of can you attribute to what source? And, you know, we've decided not to geek out too much on it, even as a data company, because there's just a lot of smoke and mirrors. And you're right. just like, you know, all right, well, traffic is growing. Right. <laughs> and we're happy with that. And we, we know we continue doing the same things we're doing. But it is very difficult to, uh, you know, attribute traffic to PR. Single biggest thing you've learned from the PR journey? Oh, uh, that's a good question. I, I, I think, <laughs> I don't know if there's a single good lesson. You know, it, it is really <laughs> just about, you know, playing the long game and not looking for the short wins, right? Because you have something that comes out in the Financial Times, you're looking at your Google Analytics, and you're like, where's the uptake? Where are the purchases? And like, you very rarely, if ever, sort of see immediate impact. And so, you know, you do things like this, right? Which is, you know, you're not trying to get immediate feedback, but you're really just trying to get awareness out there. And, and in the long term, these things win. So, yeah, I guess just not focusing on the short term. Victories. I like that. It, it puts me in an awkward position when uh, my PR person doesn't deliver over the course of mm. several months. I'm like, okay, Scott told me to do the long game, but it's really <laughs> expensive right now. Uh, you just got to find a good person, I suppose. Yeah. No, I, I, I hear you. Yeah. I think, you know, it's just... Um, you know, eventually you start getting the calls from the better publications, from the better conferences, and that's really what it's about. It's sort of just, you know, asserting yourself as the thought leader. But you've already done a pretty good job that, of that, Matt, so I think you're doing pretty well there. Oh, yeah, but this is not about me. This is about you, Scott. Back <laughs> when you started Rent, Rent My Place? Yeah, Renting Your Place. What was that? It was basically, you know, hey, I, was, I had like, you know, five properties in Santa Monica. I was a geek, you know, and I was really trying to do all the A-B testing about what was working, what wasn't working, how was I competing with my, 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 my competitors, how was I marketing, you know, what photo layouts made the most sense. So like, you know, just as a, as a data geek, you know, I just uh, wrote an e-book basically a, a long time ago, which is like my best practices for how to do a vacation rental business. Uh, and then, you know, I decided, well, I need to turn that into a website to be able to monetize this information 
information in a bit of a better way, right? And so really it was just sort of like regurgitating an ebook into a website, you know, at the time and just trying to figure out how to uh, monopolize on all the SEO terms, right? So anybody searching for like, you know, best property management for Airbnb, you know, like how could I just sort of rank for all of that? And in the early days it was all about Airbnb. Yeah. Is it still all about Airbnb? Uh, in terms of like the search terms out, out there no, these days? No, things yeah. that you guys are yeah, focusing on. As a business, obviously, you know, it's got a lot more complicated um, over the last few years. I think we started with Airbnb because Airbnb had the most um, dynamic calendars, right? So the calendars were updated real time, right? You couldn't sort of like not update your calendar on Airbnb, right? You got a reservation, you know, uh, Airbnb was the merchant of record. And so your calendar was updated in real time. Compared and, to all these other sites and independent things like right, all over the place. Right. Craigslist ads and you had to call in and they never updated their, right. you know, their, their sites. And so we could build the algorithm on the calendars on Airbnb, unlike the other, the other platforms. But now that, you know, HomeAway, Verbo has gone to, you know, more of the, uh, uh, sort of uh, being the merchant of record or, or you know, being uh, instant bookable sort of properties, you know, now we can analyze those, those platforms. Oh, so you're well. starting to look at those too? Yeah, no, so yeah, we do. We look, we look at everything listed on, on, on Verbo around the world. Uh, you know, starting to, starting to look at booking.com is a bit more complicated just because yeah, it, it, they have like depth of supply issues in the way that their website's built. Dutch. It's a little bit different. Just yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, the goal is to have all of the data for all, of, you know, the major OTAs, so, you know, around the world and have a bunch of, you know, we have about 500 thousand properties that give us their data directly nowadays so you know the complication is pulling all this like scrape data with like source data we have about 20,000 Airbnb hosts that give us directly their their data through another method and so it's just you know it's a complicated data soup and so you're trying to figure out data how to, soup. <laughs> yeah how to um, the most out of okay it. we're getting ahead of ourselves sure. here my friend let's go back to the beginning you're from yeah. California. You said you're a data person. You look more to me like a surfer dude. <laughs> I was, uh, you know, I grew up in the, yeah, I grew up pretty close to the beach in Southern California. So I grew up in around Calabasas area, which is just in Linda, Malibu. Um, yeah, so I, I was sort of born and raised out that way. Um, what were your parents doing? My, my, my parents actually started to start up when I was uh, in, in a freshman in high school. They started something called comfind.com, which is the original business directory online. So it was sort of a... Uh, I, it was sort of Google before Google, right? So you could actually search for, you know, pizzerias or haircuts online uh, using their service. Did, did, what year was this around? 1994 they started. Wow. Yeah. So they were tech people or what? My dad is, yeah. He's an engineer. He's been a computer engineer for ever, 30 years. So since, we know where you get that. Since that was his profession, yeah. <laughs> okay. And what was mom? Uh, so what mom was, mom? Uh, she was an investment banker actually. And then she got into, they started this business together. So she was sort of the marketing arm and my dad was the computer whiz. Cool. That sounds like a good team. Are they yeah. still a good team? They still are a good team. Yes. They've had lots of entrepreneurial endeavors since then, but yeah, you know, they definitely laid the seed for me in, in you know, early days. Um, I didn't get right into that right away, but I always, you know, had that sort of ambition. To what be. was your studies th focusing on? Uh, studies, I did economics at the University of Arizona. My studies was really in having a good time early on, I'd say. Uh, <laughs> the economics of <laughs> yeah, partying. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, I started landing a job in a consult. It's Corn Ferry International. They're you know a multi-billion dollar um, consulting firm, but mostly on HR recruiting. You know some relatively boring stuff. But I ended up leading their. I was there for nine years, leading their business intelligence unit at that company. So you know I had a you know maybe sixty people reporting to me at one point in time at that company. Whoa. Before I started. That uh, was like your first again. main professional career. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's got a lot of people reporting to you right out of college. Yeah, so it was like a, like a knowledge management function, a research function, and some business intelligence people reporting to me. Um, so that's good. I was there for nine years. So it was, it was a long haul. I learned a lot, but I, you know, I learned how to sort of uh, analyze all of their data, mostly for internal purposes. So it was you know, mostly like trying to analyze our employee performance and go-to-market strategies and you know, boring corporate stuff. But you know, it taught me a lot about how to sort of visualize data to people that made it really you know, comprehensible and mm. made it easy to understand. Mm. So, Which is you know, what you do so well so, now. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So it was nice to kind of marry exactly like I had some decent knowledge on how to run a property in a successful Airbnb business. And I had a lot of experience on how to like use data, manipulate it, visualize it. And so it was kind of a perfect marriage at the time to kind of create AirDNA. Hmm. And so you started AirDNA, what, like while you were at the previous company on your site in the evenings? No, you know, I actually, you know, I left... I left that company, got Corn Ferry in 2012, and I went out to go travel for six months. Nice, where did you uh, go? I uh, went all through Southeast Asia, so like, you know, the Vietnam, Cambodia, Thailand, that's Bali, like that whole sort of trip. And it was a beautiful, beautiful trip. When I had, you said Bali, just now I got goosebumps, because we went to Bali, we did an episode of the show last year, yeah. and just the mere mentioning of Bali, like transported <laughs> me back there, right. it is a magical place. It really is. I really want to explore the rest of these areas. It was, yeah, it was great. It hit 
hits me hard and it cuts me deep I'm a thousand miles from happiness thousand miles from you you know, and it's actually pretty funny because I, 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 I was dating now my wife right before I went on this trip and she's a travel writer and travel influencer and she never had a job in her life and she has sort of always traveled the world doing TV shows or writing for publications and so she sort of inspired me not to ever go get a real job again. And Where'd so, you meet her? Uh, I met her online actually on Match.com. So oh, cool! Enough, you weren't yeah. all, you weren't an existing follower of her work. I was I was not. No, she sort of randomly reached out to me with like an anonymous you know, anonymous profile saying, "Come to my website and." Email me if you like what you see. Um, but anyways, yeah, so it was a pretty awkward introduction. But so, so <laughs> wait, wait what did you do on your first date? What did we do on our first date? Yeah. Uh, the normal first dates. She took me to a lot of fancy restaurants, and I had to pay for all of her restaurants. Yeah. Okay. Uh, that's how, first typically date, how LA date, yeah. yeah. And you, you uh, at least uh, ap appealed to her enough that they kept going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, so it was great. So she, she uh, sort of instilled this whole travel sort of mentality. Like, you know, there was a business in travel. She was doing it as sort of, a, you know, maybe more of a, a public sort of figure as the talent. Um, but, you know, when I was doing the Airbnb thing, we started just kind of, you know, brainstorming on different ways sort of monetize that business. And, you know, she had a website. And so, you know, we started just started talking, you know, over drinks on how to sort of create running your place originally. What, what is her name? Uh, Julia Diamond. Julia Diamond. I'm going to follow her. Yeah, you should. Um, on social media. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Not like soccer. Yeah, <laughs> <I> mean, <right. laughs> um, so you're, you're having this, like, it, you know, the, the romance centers your life. You're, you're starting our air DNA. Uh, she's influencing you with the travel thing and starting to think a little bit more globally. Mm -hmm. And you're taking into account your, your data um, experience. And air DNA at the very beginning was um, a simple ebook slash resource. Yeah, it was. So it was really sort of a, 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 a product created within the rentingyourplace.com sort of website experience, right? And it was a place, you know, where it was some basic PDF reports that we created originally for, I think, just California originally, which was basically, you know, we, we did some scraped data, some really ugly charts and a five-page PDF that sort of said, here's, you know, how many properties there are. Uh, here's, you know, how much we think they're charging on a nightly basis. And it was pretty rudimentary, as everything starts, right, as an MVP. Right? Um, it's eerily similar to the way that I got started with vacation rentals. I wrote a, an ebook about all the things I had learned from marketing my own vacation rental business in Panama. Uh, boost occupancy, that's what it was called. A terrible, terrible cover. $97. And I made four versions of it with only one difference between them was the word um, either vacation rentals, hotel, bed and breakfast, or resort. And I made four miniature websites, and I sold the ebook on each of those four websites. The exact same material, but just geared towards the, uh, with the wording of these different. And vacation rentals outperformed all the other ones, and that became vacation rental marketing blog. Interesting, yeah. So it kind of self- I did the same thing while I was doing all the SEO research on what is the best title for me to become an Airbnb expert, and it was the Airbnb Experts Playbook, and so that was my title. And so immediately a month later, I was getting calls from like Bloomberg and Wall Street Journal, like I Google Airbnb expert, and you were the you. first one. I was like, <laughs> that was easy. So the Airbnb <laughs> phenomenon is is an important part of your life. Yeah, huge. Without it, you'd probably be doing something different. At least your company would probably be called something different. Yeah, no, huge. I mean, honestly, the reason I, you know, I got into Airbnb was because I couldn't find a decent job after I left my, my old job. Like, corporate America doesn't like a six-month gap in your calendar. I was very much a generalist. I couldn't find a decent job. Oh, yeah, right. And did that trip, like, did you have a little soul-searching? Oh, totally. Yeah, totally. So I was going to take a job at, like, KPMG or something, be a consultant, road warrior. And I was like, man, I just can't. Go I can't it. do it. Yeah. And so, you know, that was when I sort of made my first, my first decision to kind of, you know, have my first investment property, you know, doing the corporate lease model, basically, like pretending it was a corporate lease, trying to sign as many, you know, around Santa Monica as I could. Um, and so it was pretty early, early days. People didn't really know that this was sort of just like I was just, you know, flipping their, their property into an Airbnb property at the time. So, you know, it was just, you know, putting 7,000 bucks on bucks in your credit card, opening the property, furnishing it, you know, in a weekend and throwing it on Airbnb. And so that was sort of the, the model I played with for a couple years, uh, so between like 2012 and 2014. Basically, I was just, you know, growing. Uh, I had about 10 at the end of that and, tenure. And I'm guessing there must have been a point with the AirDNA stuff at which you're noticing that 
it's, it's positive, it's moving in the right direction, there's a place for this kind of service, but it's also not the kind of thing that you just throw together on the side, it's going to require some formal like business building and technology and things like that. What was the first like leap in the AirDNA story? Uh, there's there's a lot of them, right? I mean, the first the first thing is really finding the the technical talent, right? You know, as an unproven CEO with a you know a really crappy like WordPress it. site, <laughs> you know, trying to get somebody you know from you know MIT to come and you know, join my team and build out this database and sell them on the future of what Airbnb is going to be to hospitality and lodging. You know, five ten years from now, that was that was a big that was that was, that was difficult. <laughs> and Did so, you get as far as to like having interviews with people and meetings and trying to convince? Well, them nobody had even yeah, nobody even who even take a what meeting with me, fine? right? Yeah. So I was lucky that I had a good friend Tom, who's now my chief revenue officer. Um, you know, he he joined me after I joined the, uh, after I hired the CTO, but it was a friend of Tom uh, who he knew and convinced to sort of join me, uh, and that was really game changing for us, right? Like you just need, you know, it's really hard to get good technical talent, you know, and especially when you're early on, you're building the database, you're building the website, you're building a lot of stuff, a front end, you know, charts. And, and so, you know, he was uh, instrumental in sort of getting us that next stage, uh, you know, so it's really hard finding that technical co-founder, I think is just, that's so important to find early on. Uh, and the finances, I mean, developing technology is not a, a finite or cheap thing to do. Yeah. My impression uh, is that it's not only incredibly expensive to afford someone like, uh, what was his name? Yeah, it's Doug. Doug. Yeah. But you also constantly have to be improving it and, and, and there's almost the end is not in sight. Yeah. How do you know do you, that? <laughs> you know, it, it's funny. I, you, my, my, my dad does work with the company uh, today. I don't know if you knew that. So, no. so, yeah, so he is sort of a, a co-founder of, of AirDNA. He is a co-founder of That's AirDNA. Awesome. And so he's, uh, he's been an awesome resource and uh, he's been able to really help out and sort of manage, you know, all of the sort of small decisions that we need to make along the way to sort of be as efficient as, as we can. Um, and so it's great to have him on board. You know, he's, he's, he's getting near 70 now and still crushing, you know, his 12 hour days with, with me. So 12 hours. Yeah, we're still I was working thinking pretty maybe hard. he drops in in the afternoon, like for 30 Not really, minutes. No, he's up at four talking to guy, my guy in India and he's, he's, he's working hard still. Yeah. This is a family business. It is a family business. Yeah, it definitely is. Yeah. So it's, a, and, it's exciting. And he's a vested, uh, he's an investor. In he, the company too. He, he's 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 invested his sweat equity in the in the company. So yeah, no capital. We started this all on my Airbnb income, right? So this was all funded from my yeah. Airbnb income uh, early on. Huh. So for the first year, while well, we were not really making a dollar, so I was paying all the sort of tech costs and AWS costs and all that stuff out of my Airbnb, or my Airbnb money. So, until you got to a point where you were ready to kick things up. Well, until, until we started uh, making enough money to actually pay pay people from the from the revenues. And was yeah. it like a slow? growth in terms of focus or was there literally a pivotal moment where you're like okay this is going to become all that we do and we're going to make this mm -hmm. the tool that is the most cited tool in the world i think that's why we've been successful was you know a real um focus just early on like this is what we are this is who we are this is our north star we are market intelligence we are going to do exactly this it's going to be market-based we're going to do we're not going to do Dynamic pricing early on, right? We're not going to do this. We're not going to do hotels. We're not going to do tempting, tempting, yeah. but we're not. Yeah. So you see all those, you know, as they sort of the shiny objects as they call them in the industry, right? And so we, I think that's the one thing we did well is that we we knew that this was something that existed in the hotel industry, existed in a lot of other industries, you know, exists for Amazon, right? Like there's just nobody that gives you the market intel uh, on the marketplace. And we understood sort of the real estate implications of this. We understood that operators needed to figure out, you know, how to benchmark better. Like we understood exactly what, what that gap in the marketplace was um, and that it was broader maybe than just, you know, a property manager trying to figure out like what to do or what knobs to sort of to turn, you know, the implications of this were much more broad based in terms of how it impacts how hedge funds are trading on this, how hotels are going to compete against this, how, you know, how people, how hotels are going to price, right? And so uh, we want to just make sure we had the best data and the best product would sort of be able to stem from the best data. And so our, our, our focus from the beginning is just make sure we understand the best way to gather the data, aggregate it, model it, you know, and have the most accurate demand uh, on the vacation rental industry. Uh, all right? in one little, simple little bow. <laughs> yeah. um, but <laughs> I have a question about um, how you make money, how AirDNA's um, business model 
works. So you have done all of those things that you just mentioned. What, where are the places in which you're receiving money? Yeah, so um, the majority of our money comes from our MarketMinder product. So MarketMinder is um, our sort of flagship product. It covers about 100,000 markets around the world. And so that is uh, average price point of 50 bucks a yeah, month. I bought one for 50. Yeah, cool. Yeah. New Orleans, actually. New Orleans for 50? Yeah, I was just really curious about New Orleans. Was it yeah. cheap? Yeah. yeah you may, I might have got a discount, stuff. actually, I think. Oh, you did? But anyway, yeah. <laughs> there's these reports that if mm. you're going to go in and consider investing or want some comparisons, you can purchase a market report. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so it is sort of, um, yeah, it is our flagship SaaS product, right? So you can enter in any city, neighborhood, zip code in the world. It throws you into a product where you can see sort of like what's, uh, what are your competitors doing? What are the top running properties? What's the occupancy historically moving into the future? You know, you can actually load up your property and see like how, what our recommended rates are for your property. So our dynamic pricing tool, you can uh, see how you perform versus your peers. We automatically create comp sets and say like, how are you doing off season or, or peak season? And like, how does that looking? So, you know, it's a pretty robust tool and that's where we're investing most of our time and energy is making that really the one-stop shop. You know, when are you going to want to go invest in a property? How do you set it up for success? How do you price it? How do you benchmark your performance versus your peers? And how do you go buy that next property and sort of get in that flywheel of just like setting up properties and, and buying more? So you've got people who are considering investing in properties that, that purchase these reports. I'm guessing you have like realtors. Are they yeah. loving it? Yeah, realtors love it. I mean, it's, it's obviously a huge part of transactions and, and vacation rental destinations is, is short-term rentals. And if they can kind of create a report with something called Rentalizer, which is you know, put in an address and it'll tell you how much you know, we think that property will earn over the next year. It's called the Rentalizer? Rentalizer, yeah. Wow. And so when, when, a, when a realtor can go to you know, somebody and say, hey, you know, don't buy this you know, half million dollar property, go buy this million dollar property because it's going to make you three times more money. You're going to like staying there more, you know, more when you have that month out of the year to go stay there. And so it's a great upsell opportunity for, for realtors and it's a great way to get them across the finish line and like, mm. you know, what they can afford. And now that more lenders are actually lending off of you know, historical vacation rental uh, revenues and you know, we think in the future they'll be able to lend on what you know, they, they anticipated revenue right. as a vacation rentals that uh, this will sort of open up sort of the floodgates for, for more uh, second home ownership and more investment properties. So I'm, I'm thinking like a buckets of kinds of individuals who are, who are purchasing these things. There's the investors themselves. There's the existing vacation rental professionals who want to compare their performance or in, improve their business amongst their competitors. There's the realtors. Um, there's potentially banks and people who are looking at lending and things like that. Are there yeah. any other demographics that seem to be eating this stuff up? Well, you know, real, real estate is just a big industry, right? And so to even trying to figure out what is real estate right. and like where is the data right. and who are the providers, I mean, that's a big market that we are sort of just scratching the surface on. You know, if you think about commercial real estate, you know, you think about that from a hotel perspective or whether that's just like traditional office space, you know, you know, this is this having a big impact as commercial developers are thinking what is the highest and best use case of any piece of real estate, right? As they're building some new 10-story building, what percentage should be short-term rental, long-term rental office? And so we see that as a huge opportunity because you can imagine how many buildings around the world are sort of going through that thought process every single day. Um, and that's, and that's, a, that's a market that we're starting to sell into it, as well. Were you, is that what you're talking about at your real estate uh, conference or convention that you said you attended? Yeah, so I was at Inman recently talking there, but that's Inman. much more of the sort of broker realtor market okay and so we, we love that market not just because the realtors are selling that those those properties but the brokerages are you know often property management companies themselves right and so the, the, the brokerages want to own these sort of contracts with homes for second homes because you know they're gonna uh, manage those properties make money off the management but also when that owner wants to sell the property they're they're gonna automatically and that's often in the contract is that they get they get the sort of uh, they become the, the, the agent for the sale mm. um, and so that is a, that is a big market and I feel like that they aren't managing properties very well they need a lot of tools and insights mm -hmm. to help do that better um, so yeah that's that's a market as well and I'm guessing that all these people are like giddy with excitement about vacation rentals and Airbnbs. They've heard about it. In a lot of cases, they've stayed in one. They love the idea. They get it. It is a kind of product that, that will be in the market for a really long time. There's all this positive rose-colored pitching and marketing. And, and if I'm a realtor, I'm seeing this report of how much money can be made at this house. And I'm just all about the Airbnb and, and short-term rental phenomenon. Is that dangerous? In what way? Don't just throw the question back at me. <laughs> is it dangerous 
in the sense that if everybody enters with only rose-colored glasses on and doesn't fully realize the amount of work that goes into delivering that return on the investment, or if a, realster, a realtor is selling it just because they want to sell it, not really because they have the best interest of the, the property owner's business in mind, do we run into potential issue in which people enter with the wrong expectations? Right. Yeah, reality doesn't meet expectations. Because it's uh, the best right now. Everything's great. It is good. I mean, so, but I, I think you know, what the data is representing is, is, is reality right now. But maybe the problem is that reality right now isn't reality as it looks two or three years from now. Um, so I, I'm not sure I think about that a lot. You know, I do think about not trying to inflate what we are reporting, you know, making sure we're reporting a, a realistic a viewpoint of the world. Uh, I think when you report the data, you have to show kind of what the, the bottom of the range looks like and the top of the range so that, you know, you know, the best performer is going to be earning double on the same property as, you know, you know, the sort of bottom quartile performers. And so you have to get pe people that expectation, you know, like just because you buy this property and turn it on Airbnb, there's still a lot that goes in mm -hmm. to actually driving revenue from that. I think, you know, maybe it's not talked about enough is that, you know, hospitality is one of the most cyclical businesses in the world. Right. You know, and, and when there are downturns, they feel it the quickest and the hardest. And so we've been very fortunate to be in sort of this 10 year positive cycle in, in lodging. Um, and that is one of the large, I think it is the longest cycle that's ever existed in the lodging industry. Um, mm. And so, you know, but what is not known is really how the dynamics of traditional hotels are going to mix with the you know, alternative accommodations or whatever you want to call it. You know, I, I do have this sort of thesis that you know, short term rentals will flourish while hotels will suffer even greater in a downturn. And there's a lot of reasons. But one, pe people are be looking for better deals more homeowners can be looking for more income, right? And so there will be a sort of a proliferation of properties if we ever do have sort of a, a big downturn. So people are going to be looking for discounted places to travel for work or with family, and people are going to be looking for more income. So, and, and the margins on vacation rentals are so much, much broader, right? Because you don't have to do the cleaning service. You don't have the front desk person. You don't have the food and beverage, right? And so the margins are just much more slim, uh, slim on hotels. It can be run in a, a leaner way. Yeah, a much leaner way, right? And so I, I don't really feel like you know, short-term rentals, yeah, maybe rate will get hit a little bit. People can't charge what they used to be able to charge. But you know, especially if you're in some drive-to destinations, those are usually pretty insulary to downturns, right? People are still going to travel, but maybe they're not going to travel to Paris, right? But they're still going to travel to Destin. You know? And I do feel like you know, people are just sort of like restrict their travel budget. But if you're sort of in that two-hour drive from major metropolitan area. I think those are pretty, you know, insulary from downturns. This is Sean Miller, the president of Point Central. As a sponsor of the podcast, and also as a person who recently beat Matt in a one-on-one -on -one basketball game, we have the opportunity to interview Matt and this season's podcast. While we're gonna save the full interview for the end of the season, right now we're gonna share a small tidbit with you. Enjoy. What do you think the vacation rental manager of the future, and let's define the future of in five years from now, what does that vacation rental manager look like and what's distinctly different than maybe what a vacation rental manager looks like today? The vacation rental manager of the future is doing the things that cannot be scaled. I refer to this theory as the theory of limited edition, the small batches, the things that are only done on your own terms. This is the protective force field that the property manager of the future builds to protect themselves from market shifts and industry corrections. You stop worrying about large acquisitions. You start, stop worrying about um, influxes in competition. You stop worrying about all of that if you are doing things that cannot be replicated, that are truly you, or, or perhaps more accurately, only replicated on your own terms. That covers a lot of different things. There's a lot of different ways you can be doing it. Some of it costs money. Some of it takes time. Some of it requires energy. Some of it is free. But the more deliberate we can be with our anti-scalable practices, the more of a protective moat 
we build around our businesses, and the more we guarantee ourselves a place in this future. All right, enough interviewing me. If you want to learn more about Point Central, head over to pointcentral.com slash VRMB. You can sign up for a free demo. You get free HVAC analytics, and Sean's team takes incredibly good care of people. Now let's get back to the show. How does Airbnb, do they like you? (laughs) It's a good question. It's a love-hate relationship, I'd say. Um, I think they finally have realized that they they, um, have benefited and they do benefit from our service, right? Uh, They know how many people we've inspired to go buy properties, to become, you know, rentalpreneurs, as we call them. And so they, that is not lost on them. Um, You know, at the same time, as a large company, and a large pump company is going public, you know, they you know, are obviously concerned about how much data that we are providing on, on them, on their performance, on their host, and what risk that creates for their, for their company. Um, and so, you know, we're, we're very cognizant uh, of that. Um, you know, I think we are still, we have the same sort of mission in mind, which is, you know, growing the space, growing entrepreneurship, growing the, the hosting community. And we definitely believe in that sort of, that benefit, you know, in a, on a much more global scale, right? About, you know, entrepreneurship, about keeping that money local, about creating opportunities for people to create income. Um, and so we, I think we said we had the same vision in mind, um, but we've got to continually communicate that to them. <laughs> <laughs> I saw the, the smile on my face. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. No, I think generally, we're, 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 you know, we have a good open line of communication with them. You know, we know them well um, and they know us. And so I think we- Shouldn't we've, they just acquire you? You know, it's interesting. I, th- I think we're more valuable to them as a third party, right? Because as soon as you, you're, you're acquired by Airbnb, you know, you are sort of the parrot of Airbnb. You know, you're parroting their, their party line. You're talking about what their value props are. And you, don't, you lose this sort of credibility of being a third party yeah, independent provider. Voice. Right, exactly. And so we like to sit, you know, in between Verbo and Airbnb and booking and say, you know, here's what we're seeing. And we don't really have, uh, you know, a vested interest in, in, in this data. There's power in that. Yeah. Sure. Um, but on, on paper, that would be a way for them to el- eliminate all the things that you do that bothers them. It's true, but it would also just incentivize other people to kind of jump in and do the exact same thing, I think. And so, you know, as somebody, you know, as we do a lot of scraping as well, I think there's some benefit for us being sort of that scraper and source of record and being able to disseminate this data at a relatively cheap cost because it is expensive to do. And, you know, it, it maybe there is even help on that end is that, you know, they don't have 100,000 people scraping their right. site. You know, they've got a few and hopefully, you know, we're the best at it. All right, let's talk about scraping. Because yeah. that is the nastiest word. <laughs> when you say, when I hear that, it's like I think, like someone on the road, like <laughs> trying to get up bubble gum and taking disgusting, maybe toxic paint off the side of a building. That's scraping to me. Yeah. That's what you. That's your professional. <laughs> I don't know. There's lots of terms for it. What I, is I just, it? I just, I just, you know, mean. What, what does it mean? I mean, scraping used to come from sort of like, you know, uh, so, so like site scraping, which is basically, you know, looking at a, 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 the web page and basically just looking for every single tag and taking whatever text and content is off a pay, page. That's right? publicly available. Yeah. So it's basically pulling up any sort of room and pulling down all the information on that web page, right? And that was called web scraping. You know, it's a bit different now. There's different ways to sort of get that data via sort of APIs and different ways to access the information. But basically, it's looking at every single listing that is available globally every single day and seeing what's changing, what's changing to it. And what's most interesting to us is obviously how our calendar is changing. You know, is it, you know, when there was availability for next weekend yesterday, but now there isn't availability for next weekend today, you know, what does that mean, right? What was the price that was available yesterday? You know, uh, what is the likelihood of a three-day Thursday through Sunday, you know, gone gone unavailable seven days in advance for the host that has 400 reviews, you know, it's a pretty, you know, high likelihood that's a reservation. And that would, information would previously only be available to the company that owns this, the technology that's doing all these, that's offering all these things. Sure. Or someone who's able to go to one listing and take down notes of all the little things that are changing, which of course is not a fun job. Sure. So yeah. that's the scraping idea is that you're kind of, pulling all of this stuff that is publicly available mm-hmm. on the sites. Does it ever get to a point when you're like, oh, no, we don't touch that kind of stuff? That, that kind of stuff? Um, you know, we, we don't really play, you know, obviously PII is something that, you know, isn't 
a whole lot of it on on Airbnb because you know, they they kind of randomize addresses. PII. Uh, personally identifiable information. Huh. And so in Europe, you know, it's a big thing. That you really can't share information, even an address, right? You can't even share like this address is doing this amount of money. And so that's probably the only place we're sort of trying to figure out what, how deep do we go, right? Because once you associate it to an address, then this unlocks a bunch of other information, right? On who the homeowner is and when they last bought it. And like, so there's a lot of other stuff you can sort of sell and monetize once mm -hmm. you connect to addresses. And there's ways to do that. Um, but in terms of like, we, we purposely don't really display who the host is very much. Like we don't really focus on like it's Anne's place and Anne has a bunch of properties and Anne's a professional renter. Like, right. cause that just is like, well, it doesn't do us any good. Right. And so right. we're really focused on, on the property. Um, but yeah, I don't think there's really too many hard decisions we have to do because, you know, we are get accessing public information, uh, public information. We're not really mapping that to a lot of other data. Um, and so once you start mapping it to like, you know, who's the homeowner, what's the address, and then you start to get into some like sticky areas. Uh, and, you know, we're, we're thinking about how to do that as we think it is a big real estate play. Uh, you know, without having the address, you know, it's sort of useless as like, a, you know, how you analyze in the real estate market. Um, but yeah, I think it's the only thing we're sort of toying around with is hmm. how much we go down that path. Um, and it, it seems to me that the, is, is it the direction that more and more information is becoming available to your scraping? That's the trend here? I, I think what is the trend is that it is, well, one is that it's harder to define what is a hotel versus what an alternative accommodation is, right? Right. Yeah. Because that is something that, you know, there's already other people that report on hotels in that space and they don't want to double count. And so, like, what is a, a part hotel? Is that an apartment or a hotel? Like, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and so that becomes more and more complicated. <laughs> it sounds like the beginning of a nice little SNL skit. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so that, that, that part of it becomes more complicated, as you know, as Hotel Tonight has been acquired by Airbnb, and that supply is sort of being more on the platform. And now that, you know, there's a ton of hotels on on Verbo as well, and Booking.com is almost, you know, it's mostly hotels. So trying to figure out what, you know, how to divide up what is alternative and what is traditional lodging. And even some of these places that are beginning to offer villas. I yeah, mean, yeah. A villa, for you, does a villa constitute a... I don't even know what a villa, I mean, it's not really an American <laughs> terminology. I don't even know what a villa is. Uh, a villa to me would be uh, alternative accommodation, but like, I don't, I don't know, maybe that definition is different. But you, different you, you aim to use the phrase alternative accommodations that describes the kind of properties that you want to yeah I, and I, i'd say non-hotel properties right but you know as the hotels are you know now marriott's making my life you know even more complicated to getting into the, the market um but yeah how do you define a hotel is, is tricky these days right because really these these dome domeo saunder sort of that supply you know it really is a hotel i mean this is you know 50 units in a building that are one bedroom you know units Sure, they might have a little kitchenette, right? But is that really any different? A hotel with none of the services. The <laughs> right, hotel, like exactly. no concierge or it parking. It's a limited service hotel, right? And so, how do we how do we draw the line? It, it is tricky. But you know, what used to be easier back in the day was that properties weren't using channel management solutions nearly as often, right? You know, what, if you're on Airbnb, typically you're only on Airbnb four years ago. There was no API connectivity. There was no way to sort of connect and push that real time out in the marketplace. And so sort of matching and deduping everything, you know, deduping, de you know, deduping, deduping, you know, de deduping, deduping, de de yeah. deduplication. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that, that is tricky, right? Because you got to match them up. You got to make sure you're understanding where's the best source of that information. You got to make sure you're not double counting properties and properties are always unlisting and relisting and getting a bad review and taking that down and putting a new one up. And so, you know, it's just a moving target and you know, there's, you're just always trying to figure out how to keep up with it. What's the company that you've been really impressed by, small or large, <laughs> that you think is doing some really amazing things that maybe not everyone knows about lately? Um, that's a really good question. Uh, Thank you. I, I, I think, uh, well, there's, there's so many there are companies, and obviously being at the VRMA right, right now, you know, we're looking at uh, a lot of them. Um, and I'm a bit biased maybe because I do work with some more than I do <laughs> with okay. others. Uh, I would say the one I've been working with most recently who's impressed me is a company called Future Stay. And I think they have the same goal in mind as me, is that this world eventually will not be about the professional. It will be really about the small-time entrepreneurial host, less than 10 properties. And it's sort of their full-time job is sort of managing their own small business. And so they're really trying to accommodate you know, this small-time host 
that can like, you know, in 10 minutes, get their connectivity, connect to all the platforms, market well, get a website, price it, do a dynamic pricing, kind of make that a really seamless, easy process. And that's a hard, that's a big challenge because that's inherently the most complicated demographic of all. Yeah, it is. You know, not many people are going after them because, well, one, they're usually pretty uh, cost sensitive, right? <laughs> and, you know, marketing user acquisition is really difficult for that group, right? Because you got to hope that they're praying, you know, they're, they're searching for like, you know, cheap channel management solution, right. which they don't ever do, right? <laughs> and so uh, user acquisition is, is difficult, but uh, I think they've figured out how to crack that code. But yeah, I think uh, they've, uh, they've done a good job so far. I uh, had an amazing dinner with the team from F Futures Day in um, a library in the middle of the historic district in Casco Viejo, where I live in Panama. Awesome. They took a team trip to Panama to visit several of their clients, which I think is great advice for any of the vendors out there. If you are not managing your own properties, go to some of these properties, see how your clients, your property colleagues work. And we had a delicious, um, a delicious meal, and I really like those guys too. Plus, they're from my neck of the woods, up there in the Jersey, Jersey? New York area. Yeah. yeah. So we awesome. just have that inherent you cool. know, strangeness about us. Yeah, no, no, Phil's a great guy. What is your um, big wish for this industry moving forward? I mean, I think the biggest thing holding the industry back is really the connectivity. Like, even though it's got so much better, you know, the connectivity between like, how do we push even a price out to Verbo is it's impossible. I mean, if you have like, you know, uh, most of the ways that those properties are integrated, you can't just push out like, you know, on tomorrow, put this rate in, you know, there's a lot of like rate rules and just like, you know, complications of how do we, you know, push information to the platform. You know, if you want to push rates, you've got to own the entire listing. You've got to own like the pictures and the text and all this rules. And like, you can't just sort of get in there, own a little piece and push it into the platform. And so, you know, I don't know if that's sort of strategic or it's just a, you know, a lack of the sort of their, it's just how sort of they're built on a legacy architecture. It makes sort of being flexible more difficult. But, you know, it's just, it's hard for, that's why I haven't really gotten into pricing earlier is because, you know, I, I can build a great algorithm, right? But if I can't get that into the platforms in an easy way, then, you know, I don't know how to go to market. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, that's sort of boring. It's plumbing. You know, nobody really cares about the plumbing, but, you know, until the plumbing's good, then, you know, it's hard to sort of build good technology to sort of uh, propel the industry forward. And um, together with um, your lovely wife, are you guys making any trips anytime soon? We've always got trips in mind. Uh, Vacation trips. That's what not she work. does. Yeah. No. Um, yeah. So we're going. I'm going to uh, speak at Focus Right in uh, next month, and so we're going to go down to Key West after that. Um, I've got I got three and a five year old, so it's mostly family friendly destinations these days. But uh, we'll do some kiteboarding and stuff down that way. Uh, what else we got? Yeah, we're doing Costa Rica uh, for Christmas, New Year's. Nice. Um, that's what she does. Yeah. When the, when the kids are at daycare, she's planning our next vacation. What a great wife. Yeah. No, she's great. Um, and when you're going to book where you're going to stay, I'm envisioning you like logging into the secret vault of information of Air DNA. <laughs> you're like, which property is going to be the best one for us? Yeah. How do you book? Uh, you know, she does most of the booking and I do much of the judging of like, how, how could you pick that place? Like, <laughs> it's only got 4.5 stars. What are you doing? Um, According to my market minder <laughs> study. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> So, yeah, unfortunately, I don't have a lot of time to, to do it, but I definitely give her a lot of criticism about what she's done. Um, but that is, yeah, it is what it is. Um, and do you stay in hotels ever? You know, for, for business short trips, I, I do. But if I'm going to stay there over two nights um, or if I'm traveling with my family, I'm always looking for something different. And you guys use what platforms do you use to book? I, I mean, I love Airbnb. I just know it so well. So I kind of know how to sort of uh, separate the, the wheat from the chaff. I understand like how to look for a good property. And... You know, you've been in the business a long time, too, so we've got connections in a lot of different markets and people I, I just want to meet in different cities. So mm -hmm. a lot of times I'm looking for the biggest operator or somebody that I just kind of want to go stay at their property and go kind of go grab a drink with them while I'm in town. This describes um, not only my business and the vacation rental show, uh, but I, also the podcast is really an excuse for me to um, sit down with people that I've just watched do incredible things, um, and you are one of them. So... Thank you for being on the podcast. Yeah, it's great to finally meet you, man. <laughs> and thanks for coming to our advocacy luncheon. That was really special, too. Yeah, great job moderating that. It was, it was, super, it was super interesting to get all the, the brains in the same room. And for sponsoring. It, it requires a certain kind of business that's willing to step up and support things that maybe don't have immediate outcomes. And my big takeaway from you today is that 
thinking long term and where you want to position yourself uh, is equally as important. Yeah, let me totally agree. Yeah, we, we don't really, you know, I don't, I don't get anything out of advocacy besides it's sort of the right thing to do and it's sort of a business I believe in. And I believe that the way this sort of is moving is that it's, 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 it's helping maybe even the bigger businesses, the Marriott's and the really professional operators and markets. Um, and it's really squeezing out the small guy, right? And so a lot of this, you know, new regulation, as it does, sort of benefits big business at the expense of the small guy. And so that's the, one of the reasons I'm, I'm involved is because I really want this to be something that everybody can participate in, you know, down the, down the road. I feel the exact same way. I end all podcasts with a high five. Love it. You want to do it? Sure. <laughs> want to go get a po' boy? <laughs> Let's do it, yeah. <laughs> I'm in. Hey, folks. Thanks for listening. I just wanted to remind everyone that this episode was brought to you by Point Central, the home automation experts of our industry. You can head over to pointcentral.com slash VRMB, fill out the form, and take a free demo. You'll also get free HVAC analytics, and I can promise you that Sean's team will take great care. Thank you.